History as it happens, June 6, 2023, after D-Day. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. We may be approaching a fateful hour. All night long, bulletins have been pouring in from Berlin claiming that D-Day is here. Claiming and so, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The liberation of France began 79 summers ago when Allied armies invaded Normandy. After D-Day, it took nine months for the Allies to cross the Rhine. Nine months of fanatical German resistance, supply woes, commanders' egos, and more. Everyone's familiar with D-Day, so let's talk about what happened after the Liberators stormed the beaches of northern France. Next, as we report history as it happens, a podcast from the Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and take out the enemy guns. Not only that, I think we have a Saving Private Ryan. I think we have a small unit combat view of war in general, which is completely out of sync with the major wars of the 20th century. August 25th, 1944, one of the most memorable scenes of the 20th century. Allied armies march down the Champs-Élysées, the liberation of Paris. The city celebrates its liberation with a climax. De Gaulle is coming to Paris. This old British movie tone in the AP video archive will probably always make people smile. So much gratitude and joy, throngs of French citizens greeting American GIs, the liberators, and they believe the war would be over by Christmas. Well, you know, my first memories of the Second World War, and I mean cultural memory here, were shaped by movies, and I'm hardly alone in that, especially the 1962 film The Longest Day. When I first saw it as a teenager, I was so impressed, and it seemed so realistic, too. I don't have to tell you the story, you all know it. Only two kinds of people are going to stay on this beach. Those that are already dead and those that are going to die. Now get off your butts. You guys are the fight 29. Robert Mitchum played General Norm Coda, who stormed Omaha Beach with his men in the teeth of German machine gun fire. It wasn't until much later in life when I learned that such heroic, even sanitized depictions of war were divorced from reality. Although I still like that movie, in fact I watch it every June, and it still influences my memory of the great Allied victory. And as I mentioned, I'm hardly alone in that. Glory, heroism, sacrifice, it's how politicians tell us to commemorate war. Just listen to Ronald Reagan on the 40th anniversary of D-Day in a speech atop the cliffs at Point du Hoc in 1984. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. And these are the heroes who helped end a war. Gentlemen, I look at you and I think of the words of Stephen Spender's poem. You were men who in your, quote, lives fought for life and left the vivid air signed with your honor. I think I know what you may be thinking right now, thinking we were just part of a bigger effort. Everyone was brave that day. Well, everyone was. Do you remember the story of Bill Millen of the 51st Highlanders? Forty years ago today, British troops were pinned down near a bridge waiting desperately for help. Suddenly they heard the sound of bagpipes, and some thought they were dreaming. Well, they weren't. They looked up and saw Bill Millen with his bagpipes leading the reinforcements and ignoring the smack of the bullets into the ground around him. And that scene Reagan described there was actually in the movie The Longest Day. But what takes up less space in our collective memory are the less heroic stories of GIs blown up by errant bombing from aircraft on their own side. That was a chronic problem for the Allies in Normandy. And many U.S. planes were shot out of the air by their own soldiers who mistook them for Germans. 
Men were also run over by tanks, stepped on landmines or booby traps. They were dropped from their aircraft so low to the ground the parachutes had no time to open, or they were dropped into a swamp where they drowned. Green soldiers were killed by the thousands in their first encounters with hardened German units. And something else you don't really see in movies like The Longest Day or even Saving Private Ryan— Civilians paid an appalling cost for the liberation of France. Almost 20,000 French civilians were killed during the invasion of Normandy, many by Allied bombing, aircraft and artillery of their cities and villages. In the first five months of 1944, before any Allied soldiers landed in France, 15,000 civilians were killed in preparatory bombing for Operation Overlord. And there's something else we don't like to think too much about, but it is a reality in all wars, and that is atrocities committed by our own side. All this is to say is my guest today wants us to think more critically about war, even or especially about World War II, the so-called good war. A good place to start is the campaign after the famous D-Day landings, which ground to a bloody slog once it reached the German border in autumn of 1944. You may remember Cathal Nolan from my D-Day episode last June. Now he's back to talk about what happened after D-Day. He is a cutting-edge military historian at Boston University and the author of, most recently, Mercy, Humanity and War, which I reviewed for the Washington Times. You can find my book review at WashingtonTimes.com, and we're going to talk about that book here today, too. Cathal Nolan, welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. So you're my unofficial now D-Day correspondent, I'll call you that. (laughs) June 6 has a prominent place in popular memory. If you ask Americans to name an important date from the First World War, I can't even. (laughs) April 1917, when we declare war, but we don't really get involved into any major fighting. I guess the Battle of Belleau Wood, although I can't name the precise dates of that in 1918. The next, about 10 months, 11 months later. yeah. Yeah. December 7th, 1941. June 6, 1944. So the Allies secure the beaches. They convince all the Germans the war is over and on to Berlin. We've won. What's wrong with this admittedly cartoonish picture? The Battle of Normandy alone took another seven weeks. The vast majority of the casualties remain to be suffered and inflicted following D-Day. And it took 11 months for the combined Soviet Western Allied pincer attacks invasion of Germany to bring the war to an end. So we really want me to be provocative. And Please. Probably, I think what D-Day, the success of D-Day and the success of the Western Allies in France and then subsequently in uh, the Western parts of Germany, in Western Europe, I think what the Western Allied invasion did was secure half of Europe for the non-communist alliance and cause after the war. I'm not quite sure I'd go this far, but you could, if you really wanted to be provocative, you could say that what D-Day, the success of D-Day did, had the Allies been thrown back into the sea and it was delayed, I don't know, how many months, how many, maybe to the next year, you might have seen Red Army boots dip in the Atlantic. Why would they have stopped? They would have kept killing Germans. Yeah, so this episode is titled After D-Day because I do want people to start thinking differently about the Allied invasion of Europe. And this touches on some of the themes in your book, Mercy, Humanity, and War, that we're going to get to later on in this conversation. Because we might have maybe, I don't know if you agree with this, a Saving Private Ryan image of the typical American GI in France. What do you think? I think that's true. And not only that, I think we have a Saving Private Ryan. I think we have a small unit combat view of war in general, which is completely out of sync with the major wars of the 20th century, and even the major wars of the last two to 300 years. That's going to sound paradoxical to some listeners, because you did have some more small unit fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan and um, in counterinsurgency conflicts and so on. But World War I and World War II were not counterinsurgency conflicts. They were mass armies. We're not even talking about millions in uniform. We're talking in World War I, over 70 million men wore uniforms. In World War II, uniformed and non-uniformed combatants, probably in excess of 150 to 200 million. This is no way that these kind of conflicts are decided by individual morality, individual heroics, bands of brothers, and saving private rights. By the way, the bands of brothers uh, thing, I think, is quintessential American view of war. Does it happen? Yes, it happens. Is it the essential ingredient of combat psychology and experience? in wars as big as World War I or World War II? No, it was not, because 
the casualty rates in the major battles of those wars grew so high that, you know, what psychologists call small group bonding or band of brothers, if you want, couldn't form. You weren't together long enough. The replacements came in. Even in the TV series, Band of Brothers, there's an episode called Replacements where they come. They don't want to bond with the new guys. They don't want to bond with the rookies because they're going to get killed. They don't want to go through that. Um, well, it's good that they showed that. I haven't seen too many of those shows. I have seen Saving Private Ryan and some of the others. It's not that those shows don't show how violent and gory war was, but maybe they miss out on other things. I'll just cite an example here from Anthony Beaver's book, The Second World War. As you know, Cathal, I like to read to my guests. Uh, he's talking about the Battle for Normandy. As you said, it took seven weeks to win this battle. In the U.S. Army, combat performance varied greatly, not only between divisions, but even within them. Psychological casualties could be high in green divisions, and the rate of nervous collapse among ill-trained and badly handled replacements was unnecessarily disastrous. To arrive at night in a new unit at the front without knowing anybody, and in most cases woefully undertrained, could hardly have been more demoralizing. The other soldiers shunned them, as you just pointed out, because they had arrived to replace their buddies who had just been killed and whom they were still mourning. And I also read a Beaver's D-Day book. It talks about in most units, it was very difficult to get men going. They didn't want to be there. It wasn't that they were cowards. It was just a very difficult thing for commanders to get men who were poorly trained, frightened, inexperienced, what have you, to get them moving to engage the enemy. Right. No, that's true. And actually, on the uh, a couple of things to say about that. On the Allied side, the closer it became obvious to everyone. So we're talking after the Battle of France, once you got into the forest fighting and penetrated into Western Germany, February, March, April 1945, more obvious it became to everyone that the war was going to be over soon, the more that phenomenon was exhibited in allied units, all allied units, British, Canadian, American, even elite units. The reason being that the allies by that time too, allied infantry in particular, understood that they had such a massive, they didn't have air superiority, they had air supremacy, certainly on the battlefield, even over Germany. And the Luftwaffe was gone by this point. They were destroyed over 100% over and over and over. They were were destroyed, I think, in March and April of 1945, something like 400%. Military math is weird, but 400%. Anyway, the Allied troops would frequently advance. They'd encounter a German machine gun or a mortar position or an isolated dug-in tank or something like that. And instead of assaulting it the way they were trained and they had tactics to do and they had the equipment to do, very frequently they would hunker down and call in an airstrike. Perfectly rational, perfectly reasonable, highly effective. It meant that, however, they were making slower progress than their commanders wanted. After the war, I mean, let's say about 10 years after the war, when the you know the Bundeswehr was had replaced the Wehrmacht and the Germans, the West Germans were on our side. And and also about 10 years after the war, you started to getting the phenomena that you get after wars frequently, where veterans go over to talk to the veterans on the other side. They're no longer enemies and they want to sort of understand who their foe was. And the Germans would frequently kind of still have that swagger and say, we were better soldiers than you were. Yeah, you know, it is, it is, sorry to interrupt, it is unsettling to say or think that in the campaign in the West, the most committed, the most tenacious, and mm. fanatically believing soldiers were on the German side, not ours. Especially the 17 and 18-year-olds of the Hitlerjungen division, yes. uh, the 12th SS Panzer. I, I was just going to say that the, the Germans would go on and say, sort of, you know, you would hunker down, you would call in air power and so on, because you had better artillery, you had better, uh, more artillery, you had more air power and so forth, which I think is a fundamental misunderstanding of war. The idea is, of course, to have massive superiority in the most destructive elements of combined arms conflict. And this outdated, willful macho of we were better man to man. Yeah, but you lost. You didn't just lose. You were absolutely annihilated, catastrophically eliminated. You will never rise again. And that is the actual nature of making successful war, not what you were doing, riding on the backs of half tracks with panzers, with underprepared logistics and bad battle plans and no actual strategic idea of how to win the war. Yeah. You just try to win the next battle or the next operation. And Sorry. orders not to retreat either from uh, the Fuhrer. Another thing I learned about this, we're going to get into the actual campaign here, the battle for Ka and what happens after that in late July to the... Uh, Liberation of Paris in August, but something else I learned here, the number of American soldiers 
killed by their own aircraft, and vice versa, the number of times American soldiers shot down our own aircraft because they worried it might have been a German. Yeah, that happened in Sicily as well. Yeah, horrible yeah. number of casualties, uh, yep. friendly fire casualties. It's That doesn't come to mind when we think about our heroes who liberated Europe. Well, the other thing is the Americans, I think it was the Americans, I might be wrong, it could have been the British, once terribly bombed the Canadians uh, and actually interrupted the attack because they basically bombed short of where the targeted German lines were, and they, in fact, hit the Canadian advance. I think they killed over 500. Um, and the I first mean, two days of Operation Cobra high. under Bradley were delayed because in each of those two days, American bombers dropped bombs on our own men. You know, there was a joke at the time when the Germans bombed the British duck, when the British bombed the Germans duck, when the Americans bomb everybody ducks. I think it's <laughs> it's unfair, but it is funny. Well, um, there were a lot of reasons for this. Friendly fire happens on all sides yeah. in the whole it wasn't done deliberately. I mean, the technology no. wasn't there. It was hard to know, you know, yeah, these where are you dumb were. gravity bombs. You don't yeah. have direct radio communication with the ground. You don't, you know, these are massive operations beyond anything we have seen ever since before or since. And uh, on the other side, massive enemy armies. This stuff is inevitable, I think. So Caen was supposed to, it's a city in uh, okay. Normandy, uh, was supposed to be taken by the British and Canadians quickly. It was on the eastern side of the Normandy front. The Americans were on the western side. That was where Utah and Omaha Beach were. But Caen is not fully liberated until late July, mid-July, July 18th. Most of June and July were a really bloody slog. Is it fair to pin this on Montgomery? Why did it take so long for the Allies to break out of Normandy? As we talk about the brutal campaign, after D-Day. I don't think it's fair to blame Montgomery. So, I mean, you can blame Montgomery for having vastly overpromised. I mean, in the mm. planning stage, saying he would take Caen on the first day. Mm. He was also uh, very cautious, though. Yes, and there's a very good explanation for that. But what happened in, in Caen specifically was Allied planners really should not have incorporated a rapid advance on the Caen, on the left flank of the Allied advance. Then what happened was the Germans were, were dug in, the fighting was heavy, it's urban warfare, it's street by street, building by building, and the Allies said, decided, they made the same mistake at Monte Cassino in Italy. They decided that what they would do is they would bomb the Germans out of their positions. Well, in fact, as was discovered at Monte Cassino when they blew up the monastery, same thing, it's actually easier to defend rubble. There are more fighting positions, more defensive positions inside the rubble. Then they had to slog their way through the rubble. But the main reason that the British and Canadians and the Poles Poles were there as well, were slow on the left flank of the Allied advance off the beaches is because the lion's share, and I mean 75 to 80 percent of German armor in the entire battle, went up against the British and the Canadians. To which point the, you know, and battle plans adapt and so on. If you want to look, stand back and take a bird's eye view of what's happening in Normandy over this, until we get to the breakout phase, What's really have the Americans are bogged down in the Bocage and the Cotentin Peninsula. Americans know all about that. For those who don't know what Bocage is, just briefly tell uh, us. It's a deep hedgerow country, and it's always described as hedgerows. When I visited Normandy for the first time, I made a point of taking my little rental diesel French car and driving down one of these little side roads in the Bocage in the Cotentin Peninsula. There's no way you could take more than one vehicle down at a time, one tank wide at most. But these are not hedges in any kind of understandable North American or British sense. Well, of what I saw, there were actually tree lines. So we really are talking about brambles. Some of these things are a thousand years old. And you have a narrow road, you have sunken ditches on either side for drainage, and then these mounds go up. So you have a ditch. And then a mound that might be three, four, five. I saw some that were six feet high. Yeah, like and a wall. Then the, trees, then the trees begin. Oh, wow. That they're growing out of these things. They were impassable by tanks. There was a special way they finally got through these things. And Normandy is farm country. It's all divided into squares. And they're all surrounded by these hedges. And uh, what the Germans did was put a machine gun nest in the corner so that the infantry came across the field. They machine gunned down the infantry. They put anti-tank guns on the road. So if a Sherman came down, they hit the first Sherman and the next 10 were backed up and the tanks had to go into reverse and go down the next road. The Germans, meanwhile, had moved their 88 anti-tank gun and boom, and here we go again. They were slogging through the Bocage country. But they were facing much reduced German forces compared to what the British and Canadians were facing around Caen. I think it was seven out of nine 
Panzer divisions, don't quote me on that, uh, were fighting the British and Canadians. And the Canadians and the Poles in particular kept going up against what you spoke about, 12th SS Panzer, the Hitler Youth, uh, 17, 18-year-old fanatics. And Poles and Germans at this point in the war did not take each other prisoner in either direction. So here is Antony Beaver on the Bocage. The Germans described it as a dirty bush war. They would plant mines at the bottom of shell craters in front of their positions so that an American soldier throwing himself in to take cover would have his legs blown off. Alongside tracks, they rigged what the Americans called castrator mines or bouncing beddies, which jumped up and exploded at crotch height. Their tanks and field gunners became expert at firing tree bursts, which meant exploding a shell in the crown of a tree to blast splinters of wood into anyone sheltering below. He also details how green soldiers would be tricked by Germans. One German would come out, wave his arms, we surrender. Americans would come out to greet what they thought would be, who they thought would be prisoners, and then they'd all get machine gunned down. Yeah, false and, surrender, which is a war crime, but, yes. uh, you know, the, the whole war was war crimes. For the war crimes. Yeah, well, so they stopped taking prisoners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't want to well, the other that. thing yeah. is that the SS had executed, it was the Canadian equivalent of the Malmody massacre that takes place later of the Americans. They had executed, I think it was July 12th, I had checked the date, but they just lined them one after another. They marched through sort of a Louis the Fourteenth, you know, hedge and shot them in the back of the head. Uh, over 50 of them, and that word got around, and the Canadians stopped taking SS prisoners. And then the word gets to the British and the Americans what had happened to their allies, and they stopped taking it. There weren't a lot of SS prisoners taken until the mass surrenders of SS formations at the end of the war. Man, and nobody said. had to order this. It's just, you know, you have SS wounded guy, and he just doesn't make it back to the UW camp. Atrocities on all sides, but no one compares to the rampages of the SS. They no, were, no, of course yeah, not. Yeah, no. Yeah. Including burning the entire village of Urdor sur 640 something French civilians. They locked him in the church. They set him on fire. They burned him alive. When the women held their babies out the window, the Germans shot the babies. I mean, it's just, yeah, nobody. <sighs> Nobody. You don't see that in movies, or most movies. So the French I guess, know it. The French know it. Yes, yeah, they do. Well, the French, you know, are still grateful, of course, for being liberated. But Allied fire in the battle for France killed an estimated seventy thousand French civilians because of I the. I think it was about twenty thousand in Normandy. Yeah, I Normandy think. alone. Right. Allied yeah. fire. Because of the inaccuracy of bombing and the need to knock out the crossroads that the Germans would have used to reinforce You know, uh, Churchill and other Allied top leaders, but I know Churchill did this specifically, actually had gone to De Gaulle before the invasion and kind of as a courtesy, they would have done it anyway, in a sense asked permission to be sort of refiring like this as necessary. And De Gaulle gave it, of course. He understood as a general uh, yeah. what was necessary to advance. Steep price for liberation, but what was the alternative given uh, the circumstances. So we could then sum up the battle for Normandy, why it took a while. Terrain, effectiveness of German resistance. In other words, the Germans weren't ready to quit. And maybe some mistakes made by Allied commanders or, or no? Sure. There were mistakes made, as they are made in every battle, usually on both sides. Uh, the Germans made mistakes. It wasn't just Hitler. It was also German generals that made mistakes. It's got to remember, too, that the German army, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, was a vastly more experienced army in the fight in Normandy than any of the oncoming Allied armies. How many men saw their first combat on D-Day on the beaches? I mean, it was it's horrifying. Uh, fairly, high, fairly high proportion. So after Normandy, I mentioned Operation Cobra before. Uh, that helps trigger the German collapse in France. Patton's Third Army comes into existence. And in early August, Hitler decides to suicidally and stupidly begin counterattacks with German armor as the German position in France is collapsing. And the Allies have a chance here to really finish off the German army in France in what was called the Falais Gap. Why did the Allies miss this? So we've already talked about Normandy. The, the breakout occurs. They're on their way to Paris in late August. Why did the Allies miss their chance at the Falais Gap? It's still controversial, but let me give you a sort of broad brush strokes. As you correctly pointed out, Hitler's militarily, utterly unjustifiable order to counterattack and advance into the strength of the oncoming Allied, uh, in particular, he attacked toward the American position as they were coming out of the Cotentin. He ordered in nine panzer divisions. But by this point, a lot of the German divisions are divisions on paper. These were vastly reduced. Only four could actually get in position to make the attack. Anyway, those are just minor details. Within 24 hours, this German counterattack failed. 24 hours. And now the Germans have pushed themselves into a pocket, a bubble. Well, you know, what you do with any bulge is you attack the hinges of the bulge and you try and encircle completely, if you can completely. 
And what the Allies immediately saw the opportunity and the encirclement was ordered. But there was a disagreement over how wide to make the encirclement. So some wanted to just shut the bulge quickly around Falaise. Montgomery had the idea of, no, 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 look, I'm behind him now. We've broken out of Calais, uh, of Caen, sorry. We can do a wider encirclement and we can encircle the entire German armed forces in all of France, certainly all of northern France. And the decision was made, no, go for the smaller encirclement at Falaise. And then this is where the Canadian sort of, there was some hesitation of the Canadian advance. Uh, they were green troops. They didn't advance as quickly as some people wanted. There were discussions at the British High Command. Canadians were under British command as to whether or not Canadian troops should have been replaced by more experienced British troops who had fought earlier in the war elsewhere and so on. It didn't happen. Anyway, so the Allies are advancing too slowly, quote unquote. Uh, it's easy for me to say I'm not advancing across the field facing German counterfire. Exactly. Um, but they were advancing, quote unquote, too slowly from Caen toward the near end of the gap. And then uh, in an order that's never been satisfactorily explained, Bradley ordered Third Army to stop advancing to close the other side of the gap. This is what created the gap, is that the Americans stopped on one side and the British and Canadians were advancing fairly slowly on the other side. There was an extraordinarily bloody battle over a hill. It only has a number, not a name. I don't remember the number. Uh, in which the Poles, 1st Polish Armored Division, attacked SS and other German troops repeatedly. And it was just extraordinarily bloody. And again, this is where no prisoners were taken and so on. And this basically became the holding action that allowed about 50,000 Germans, we think, to get out of the gap. So there were command decisions, but who are you and I to say yeah. what the correct decision would have been? And I really don't, I'm not one of those historians who sits there and says, I know how to command a million man army. I don't, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I don't. And, and I'm very reluctant to say this general was better than that general, or this is the correct decision or so on. When they show vanity in their command, then I'll jump all over them. Well, but, Montgomery uh, didn't think Eisenhower was a field commander. So just to refresh people. He memories, wasn't, he yeah. wasn't. Yeah. He had never commanded uh, troops in the field in the first world war. His first field command, I believe was September 1st when he took over the Supreme command of all ground forces. Amazing. That's uh, right. He was in charge of Chafe, Supreme headquarters, Allied expedition. He was an outstanding political general. He made a massive contribution to the alliance, which was far more difficult than the romanticized British-American views of the war would have us believe. He made a massive contribution, but there were a lot of people, including American commanders, who thought, no, leave it with Montgomery. He's a very good, experienced field commander. Now, the usual criticism from the Americans about Montgomery... Move too slowly. ...from Beaver, that he moved too slowly. Well, the reason is... He didn't have the resources backing him up that the Americans had, who had a much more where's the enemy, let me at him, charge kind of thing, which we will see again in the valleys of Vietnam, in the valleys of Afghanistan, in the thunder run into Baghdad. It's kind of the American way of war. Well, when you're British in 1944, you've been in the war for 22 months longer than the Americans. Your units have been decimated. They're actually beginning to cannibalize certain divisions in order to keep other divisions in the field. They don't have the manpower. A lot of their men have been psychologically debilitated. This is also true of the Canadians who were still an all-volunteer force. They're just running out of men. So what do you do if you have more limited resources than the Americans and you're casualty conscious? Because unlike the Americans, in the First World War, only 25 years earlier, you lost 1.2 million dead. Yeah. What you do is you advance with caution, you build up your artillery, you advance with your air power. You still are going to win. You're still going to win and succeed, and he did. But you don't charge into it the way Patton too often, and yeah. I think overly romantically in the American view, charged. Well, let, let me ask you about this then. As I was saying, Eisenhower was in charge of the whole thing, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, Chafe, as it was called. But right. Montgomery was the command in France on the Western Front. The command structure was essential. The British had been in command of Allied forces in Africa and in Italy for the most part. But once the Americans began to significantly outnumber in sheer sort of manpower, the British contribution to the Allied war effort, it became natural to insist on having your own commander. Then the Canadian okay. army, uh, that's the first time they'd ever had a full-size army, the first Canadian army. All countries who begin to contribute significant forces sooner or later begin to insist that they fight under their own generals. The Americans did it in World War One. although Americans should remember that the United States contributed to the victory over the Germans in World War One under French command. The Americans accepted to fight under Foch, under French 
Command. Um, With French the, rifles, too. <laughs> right. Uh, and artillery. Yeah. Harry Truman was the commander of a French 75. The Americans were under-equipped. In fact, there was a term for the Americans when they arrived. It wasn't said to their faces. They were referred to as the beggar army because they didn't have aircraft. They didn't have artillery. They didn't have gas. So I guess better way of putting my question is Patton and Bradley weren't taking orders from Montgomery, or were they? Or were they supposed no, to? No, they were. They, they were. were. Okay. Yes, they were. Sorry, right. Well, this is where Eisenhower played an inestimably positive role, and he had to juggle these egos and these competitions and these, you know, sort of out-of-order maneuvers and so forth. He came very close to firing Montgomery at one point. Montgomery had to sort of go to him, grovel and apologize uh, and save his job. Patton, as you know, was fired in Italy and uh, almost never came back into the fighting. I think the thing to remember, because Americans always have this, and it's partly because of the movie, maybe largely because of the movie, this notion that Patton and Montgomery were sort of equals and Patton was better. Let me tell you, Patton commanded at the height of his command in the Second World War, a single army. Uh, he commanded Fifth Army in Italy and Third Army in France and Germany. Montgomery designed the D-Day invasion. Montgomery was the ground forces commander of all Allied ground forces from the D-Day invasion to the end of August, so the battle for France. Montgomery was then commander of 21st Army Group, which was nine armies, including British armies, the Canadian army, and I think it was three, it could have been four, but three American armies. There's just no comparing the scale of their command. Patton commanded about 100,000 men, you know, roughly average size of a World War II army. Montgomery commanded an army group, which was close to a million men, in addition to all of the other roles that, uh, that I described. Patton was an egomaniac. He wanted to get into Germany first for his own own vanity. He so, sacrificed American lives. That, that, is, that is not told often enough, how he sacrificed for his vanity, and in one case, to liberate his son-in-law. I'm a German prisoner of war camp. Here's more Beaver. Montgomery was seething over Eisenhower's decision to advance on a broad front to the Rhine and into Germany. This had always been standard American doctrine, relying on overwhelming force, so Montgomery should not have been surprised. But Montgomery also did Operation Market Garden in September, yep. which was a, a fiasco. I mean, we're getting Which into... Eisenhower approved. Which Eisenhower yes, approved. True. The point here of all... All of this is just how difficult it was to defeat oh. Germany. Getting and the across closer you got to the German border, the more the harder they fought, which is, of course, a natural phenomenon yeah. of homeland defense. You know, the watch on the Rhine, the Germans called it. So the Germans escape the Falay Gap and the Allies liberate Paris in late August. Why was liberating Paris low on Eisenhower's priority list? He didn't want to get involved in what might have become a Stalingrad situation. He didn't want to get involved in urban fighting. Two things happen in urban fighting. Your armor superiority and your artillery superiority is nullified. The classic American way of war is where's the enemy force? Let me smash it. And all that other political stuff will take care of itself. Now, that's never true. But this has been done repeatedly. Let me smash the Viet Cong. Let me smash the Taliban. Let me smash you know, Saddam Hussein's army. And you end up with these long wars of attrition because you actually haven't factored in your political consequences. But he did not want to get bogged down. However, de Gaulle is pushing to get in there. And finally, Eisenhower was persuaded. I believe the order came from Marshall. And I mean, it went to the very top. Churchill intervened and, and Marshall ordered, I, who was Eisenhower's superior. What happened then is the French took the liberation of their capital into their own hands. The liberation of Paris was an uprising. On the other end of Europe, by the way, the Poles are, are rising as well. They are going to have Warsaw completely destroyed and lose over 200,000 dead. Once the French rise, the pressure on the Allies to go and assist the brave French resistance, who had given them significant help in Normandy and elsewhere, becomes high. And Eisenhower released the French armored division under General Leclerc, and it was supported by small flanking British and American units as it moved down in its Sherman tanks into uh, down the Champs-Élysées. So we've all seen those newsreels of the Allies marching shoulder to shoulder down the Champs-Élysées, liberating Paris. And then at this point, so we're late August now. Uh, we are nearly... Yeah, August 25th. August yeah, 25th. Nearly three months after Normandy, D-Day rather. Right. Why did the belief that the war could be over by Christmas set in at this point? Because the Germans were running. They had been broken at Falaise. They were running. They were pursuing. That's why Eisenhower, the other reason Eisenhower didn't want to take Paris, he wanted to continue the pursuit of the broken German army. Almost all the military wanted to pursue the German forces and, and, and finish the job. The Allies, as you know from A Bridge Too Far, the film A Bridge Too Far, which is a very fine 
I don't usually recommend war movies, but that's a pretty good one. They advanced into the Netherlands. This is where Montgomery made his major mistake of the war. He neglected to take the Scheldt estuary now. So he took Rotterdam, but Rotterdam is inland along the estuary of the Scheldt. And if you don't control the whole Scheldt estuary, the port's useless. They needed to take the port to supply the advance into Germany itself. He took the port, did not properly understand the role of the Scheldt estuary, and the result is that the Canadians actually had to slog it out over the winter of 44, 45, canal to canal, house to house, village to village. It was brutal. It was bloody. You know, about uh, 13,000 casualties the Canadians suffered to rectify the mistake that you mentioned. And I spent a spring in Ottawa one time, and I can tell you that it's pretty odd, but every spring, very early, especially how far north Ottawa is and how cold Ottawa is, the city blooms with 100,000 tulips because the Dutch to this day still send over tulips to be planted in Ottawa for gratitude for the liberation of the Netherlands by the First Canadian Army. The key here about the Scheldt estuary is Antwerp. The Allies had to... Did I say Rotterdam? Pardon me, Antwerp. Pardon yeah, the, me, you're yeah right. the, the port at Antwerp. Yeah, sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, no, no, my fault. Well, you know, when you say certain things, I just take it for granted that you never make any mistakes. So. Yeah, that's why I get away with my students. <laughs> Without Antwerp, which wasn't secured and wasn't able to actually accept fuel and supplies until late November, without it, the Allies had to truck, literally, every ounce of gasoline over land. And as the front moved closer and closer to Germany, that supply line got longer and longer. And I think that's maybe, arguably, the number one reason why the Allied advance came to a halt at the German border yeah. at the end of the It also led to more arguments between Patton and Montgomery, who wanted the lion's share of the gas. Look, Patton and Montgomery agreed on one thing, that Eisenhower was wrong to have a broad front advance. What they disagreed on was where to make the... If you're not going to have a broad front, then a narrow thrust, sort of like an iron fist through the enemy lines. And Montgomery wanted to do it in the north, where he was, and Patton wanted to do it in the south, where he was, and they were arguing over access to the fuel. In the end, Eisenhower backed Montgomery, and that's why we got Market Garden, which was the idea as we leap ahead, these Germans are broken, there's no resistance, we leap all the way to the Rhine, and they went a bridge too far. Literally, the bridge over the Rhine at Arnhem. Some people were impressed uh, by Montgomery's plan because it was so daring and he had been so cautious. But as you say, it did not work out. So, you know, the American... It failed. It failed. But, you know, I mean, and there were flaws in the plan and the intelligence was bad and so forth. But I think you've already said the correct, I think, answer, which is fundamentally what slowed and then stopped the Allies was logistics. I think the two key determinants of the whole Battle of Normandy and France were logistics and air power. The Germans couldn't reinforce quickly enough because uh, even though their lines were shorter and they had masses of troops nearby because the Allied air power meant they could only move at night and even then it was difficult. And the Allies couldn't move fast enough because of the Mulberry Harbor, one of the harbors failed. They didn't take Cherbourg intact. It was in fact largely destroyed. That was the original plan was to supply through Cherbourg on the tip of the Cotentin Peninsula. And now Montgomery's major failure to take Antwerp and I, sorry, I did say Rotterdam. No, we don't think of supply lines very often when we envision war and we think of armies, even in the old days, right? Armies on horse riding off into the sunset. They were always trailed by many more people who had to be involved with supplies, logistics. And a lot of the wagons, a lot of the wagons were carrying hay to feed the horses that are pulling the wagons. That's right. You know, it's like, it was a vicious circle. Yeah, the infantry in a modern army makes up a small percentage of the overall Force, right? Logistics is a huge percentage of it. Yeah. Even in an American combat division in World War II, I used to know these numbers, so I'm not going to hazard them. People can look them up. But even in a combat division, the minority of troops in a combat division were actually combat troops. They were truck drivers and mechanics and artillerymen. And the heaviest thing you're hauling is ammunition. I mean, the industrial warfare is just massive amounts of ammunition. And the Allies... Artillery, but machine guns, everything. And the Allies, especially the U.S. Army, expended enormous amounts of ammunition. And as a result, they took far fewer casualties than any Allies army had taken in the First World War, defeating the Germans, Mm -hmm. uh, or the Germans did, or the Russians did. Absolutely. And then you get these, you know, raise your Bierstein 10 years later and say, we were better men than you. Well, crap, you, you, you know, you fought for the wrong leader, the wrong way, with the wrong equipment and the 
worst tactics possible at the end of the war. I tell that's one of your peeves about this chapter in history when that's brought up. So uh, we were talking here about the Allied advance coming to a halt at the German border at the end of 1944. So the war is not going to end before Christmas. The Allies actually don't cross the Rhine until March. So you know, this whole episode is about after D-Day. Think about that. Summer, June 1944, 150,000 Allied troops on the first day land in France. The Allies don't get across the Rhine until almost a year later, nine months later. So they actually get to the Rhine to in the September Rhine. and are then defeated and pushed yes. back. And Holland, which had put out the orange flags to welcome the Allied liberation, the Dutch are then reoccupied to their horror. And they go through what's called the Hunger Winter. I think it's 25, 30,000 Dutch starved to death in the Netherlands, the number one agricultural producing region probably in the world because the Germans stole all the food. The Germans were stealing food all over Europe throughout the entire war. Germans will eat. Everyone else will, will, will starve. Yeah, the number of people who just died of starvation or just murder, murdered in World War II, civilians murdered. It's a difference between 10 million dying, mostly soldiers in World War I, and 65 yes. to 70 million dying, mostly civilians in World War II, plus the deliberate extermination of civilians in uh, Eastern genocides Europe. Yeah. and also allied bombing campaigns, yes. allied bombing campaigns. And Japan and Germany. Japan so and Germany. we talk about D-Day in Normandy. That takes up a lot of space in the cultural memory. <laughs> One battle, and we mentioned this battle and this movie last year when you joined me for an episode about D-Day. Oh, The yeah. Battle of the Hurtgen Forest and the movie that probably depicts day-to-day -day life or death among green troops better than any I've seen when trumpets fade. Last time out, a hot meal was five days ago. Since then, my entire platoon has been wiped out. That's why you're here. Just a bunch of guys in line to get shot so they can bring in a bunch of other guys. See how that works? Now, once you get that through your fucking head, maybe you realize how important a hot meal could be. Don't go anywhere. Stay where I can find you. We're making a push. We get orders, Sarge? We will. Well, if we didn't get orders, how do you know we're making a push? Hot food, coffee, cigarettes. We're making a push or a shit. So the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest, I mean, this explains why it took so damn long to get across the Rhine. American troops are sent into this dark, sinister forest, as Anthony Beaver describes it, and they're cut to pieces. This is an example of bad American leadership. The Americans sent in, I think it was four divisions by the time the battle was done, but they sent them in serially. So this is like the woods of western Massachusetts, low rolling hills, pine forest, virtually no roads, rural roads, one tank wide, that kind of thing. The Germans have been there. They've dug in. They have tanks actually in place behind log barriers. They control the roadways. You can't really advance up the sides of the hills. They're too steep. They're covered in snow. They're covered in pine trees. Three burst firing by the Germans, all of that kind of thing. It's a hellhole. And the American commanders send in American units serially. So they're attacking down the road, getting decimated. Next unit comes down the road, gets decimated. We're talking to making advances of 20 yards, 50 yards, 200 yards. They weren't day. trained or prepared for this kind of combat. And they were badly led. This is one case where you can, I think, objectively say, even as I said earlier, without knowing how to general, uh, you can say that and this is universally agreed that this was badly done. As Antony Beaver said, soldiers constantly lost their bearings in the Hurkin Forest. They saw the area as an eerie, haunting region fit for a witch's lair. He goes on to say the heavy level of infantry losses since D-Day meant that an increasing proportion of frontline platoons consisted largely of barely trained new arrivals. Bradley was angry not just about their quality, but about how few of them the European theater received. He discovered that General MacArthur was securing the lion's share for his Philippines campaign. It seemed that in Washington, not even lip service was paid anymore to Germany first. And to give you an idea of how ferocious the fighting was in the West, Eisenhower's allotment of replacements per month had been about 80,000. So if you need 80,000 replacements per month, what does that tell you about how many men? 
you're losing. Right. And add to that, as I said earlier, the British and Canadians couldn't replace at that level. They were too exhausted. They'd been in the war too long. They'd lost too many guys. Too many men had been sent home with psychological wounds uh, or missing limbs or half a jaw or or whatever. And they couldn't replace them. And they're in some pretty heavy fighting there as well. People should know, I'm sure they'll look it up, the Hurtgen Forest. This is all part of the Ardennes, Argonne forest region along the Rhine. And the Hurricane battle is going to end hours and days before the what Americans call the Battle of the Bulge or the Battle of the Ardennes Forest begins. So you really go from about early October 44 to January 45, where there's constant fighting in the forests. And this is pure attritional warfare. It's not trenches. It's attrition all the same. And that movie, When Trumpets Fade, there are no hero soldiers really in that movie. There are young guys who don't know what they're doing and they want to get the hell out of there. Well, it's not a popular movie. Yeah, they're not waking up in the morning and saying, let's go save the world from fascism. Well, and they, But they were. But it is notable that most Americans do not know, unless they're very much specialists or readers of the Second World War, they don't know about the Battle of the Hurricane Forest. When the 50-year anniversary came around, uh, there were no American commemorations of the Hurricane Forest because guess what? People don't commemorate their defeats. This was impassable terrain. And this, again tells you the critical importance of terrain, whether it's a beach or a river crossing or a woody hill with no roads and so on. The Argonne and the Ardennes have been fought over for 2,000 years, going back to when the Romans were fighting, you know, the tribes of Garmania. Uh, it really is that old, uh, contested yeah. area. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into life. So here's a good point to transition then to a discussion because it's related to your new book, which I reviewed at WashingtonTimes.com. So I'm assuming you did not dislike the review is why you're here. <laughs> you agreed no, to no. Come. <laughs> it was it was it was very positive. You know, all you want from a review is that they get the book. I mean, they can criticize stuff. You could, you made some criticisms, and that's fine. Mild, mild I, nobody cares. I don't. Nobody, nobody cares about that. No. I'm also, you know, I'm I'm 67 now, and I'm. I used to say all my life I didn't really care what other people thought, but you did. But I finally reached the age that Plato predicted, where I actually don't really care. So yeah. you know, it's nice to hear good stuff, and the other stuff kind of rolls off me more. Well, you know, you do want people though to think. You yes. may not care about what some people think about you, but you want people to think, and that's why I enjoyed the book. You're trying to get people to think about war differently, and your book is titled Mercy, Humanity, and War. You cite an example of a German medic who tries – am I getting this right, or is it an American medic? Is this someone that tried to give killed by the mind? Yes. Yes. He wasn't a medic. He was a lieutenant. I'll let you uh, tell the story. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. If it's the one I'm thinking about in the Hurtgen, they had been fighting over essentially a forester's hut, which tells you how ridiculous combat can reduce to and war can reduce to a forester's hut. And it had changed hands several times. And the most recent American attack had failed. It had come within a few hundred yards. And so the Germans were in position. They had machine gun. They were defending a perimeter. So the Americans... The assault failed. They pulled back. However, I don't know how far they pulled back, half a mile, a mile. But they were out of earshot of a young American soldier who was wounded and was howling in pain and asking for help. But he was clearly out of earshot of the American medics because the whole American front had pulled back in that area. So the Germans were listening to this for hours and they were waiting. And the, the young lieutenant, he was 24 years old, the young lieutenant gave orders that under no circumstances with the American medics arrive where they to be fired upon. And then they waited and they were waiting for the Americans to come and get their wounded guy. And then they waited and they waited six or seven hours into this. They couldn't wait any longer. And he organized a rescue party. They tied white flags to branches of trees and, and they walked out. This was in broad daylight, by the way. And they walked toward where this American was lying just on the other side of a crossroads. But it turned out he was lying in a minefield. And the young German lieutenant was leading the way and he stepped on a landmine. It 
didn't kill him, which would have been merciful. It severely wounded him, multiple punctures. Uh, he was in agony. Long story short, it took about eight hours to die. It's not clear what happened to the American. I don't believe he was ever rescued. I think he would have bled out and died. But 50 years later, in the same time, in the same year that the Americans were having official ceremonies of the 50th anniversary of the D-Day invasion and so on, well, the Hurricane Forest was also 44. So there was D-Day and there was Normandy and there were presidents went across and senators went across and all of the rest of it. And nobody went to the Hurricane. Uh, and there's a memorial for this soldier there, right? But there is a memorial there, which was erected by his enemies, his former enemies. The Americans who had fought against his unit in the Hurtgen, uh, led by a then retired lieutenant colonel or lieutenant general, actually, raised the money, purchased a memorial and went over to pay homage to this merciful young German officer who had lost his life. And they erected a memorial to him, which is unusual in many ways. The obvious one being that his enemy did it. But the other one is there are very few memorials in Europe to German soldiers from the Second World War. That's true. Because yeah. of the politics, which are perfectly understandable and perfectly correct. They should visit the American South. They'd be surprised to see uh, statues for traitors. I, mean, I agree. I, a few years ago, I rode through Southern Virginia, and it was like Robert E. Lee this and Stonewall Jackson that. And I went to visit Stonewall Jackson's home, and the amateur historian there told me in all sincerity, because I was the only one of the group who said, what about his slaves? Because the slave quarters was right out back. You'd pass it to get to the upper rooms. The local historian told me, and I quote, Oh, his slaves loved him, sir. His oh, slaves yes. loved I'm him. I'm sure they like, This was um, 2017? Not 1957, 2017. Oh. You know, there's another uh, instance, and we're going to get to the, the larger issues here in a moment about mercy and war. There's another instance in your book that you cite of a, of a German who saved some children's lives, a young German soldier. Mm. Wherever he was, came under shelling. He ran in out. In the Netherlands. Yeah, in yeah, the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, yeah. So the Allies were advancing. I believe this was during Market Garden. The Allies were advancing. He was part of a German artillery unit. They got the word out. The Allies were coming up the road. So the unit ran out from the farmhouses they were staying in, Dutch farmhouse, and he ran to get to their guns a couple hundred yards away. As he was running, he noticed the two little children, I think they were ages like three and four or four and five, something like that, two little boys in the field. This, by the way, this German was 18 years old. This was his first ever action. He had graduated high school just a few months earlier. His birthday was only like a matter of a, a few days or a week earlier. He turned 18. And he saw these two boys and he just ran over and he grabbed one under each arm and he ran them into the farmhouse to give them to the parents because the kids were out playing outside and here's incoming uh, allied mortar rounds and artillery rounds. He saved their lives, ran into the farmhouse, gave them to their mother, and then ran to catch up with his unit when an allied mortar hit and he was instantly killed. Um, and when the town wanted to put up a memorial for his bravery and his sacrifice, it was very controversial because why are we putting a, you know, a statue or a memorial or whatever, a plaque, up for these SOBs, right? The yeah, Germans uh, who were it, terrible to us. It was debated at the town council. The family had kept the secret for something like 45 years. The children finally came forward and, you know, said, and they called him the good German uh, who had saved their lives. But the council wouldn't put it up. And you can see the arguments in both directions. They didn't want it to become a pilgrimage site for neo-Nazis, even though this guy was not a Nazi. That's a good argument because online it has kind of become a pilgrimage site for neo-Nazis. The town refused to erect the statue. Private funding was raised. The other thing is, the statue that was commissioned has him in German uniform, and that was a real sticking point to erect a statue of a German in Netherlands territory. At any rate, this was erected finally on private land. There's no reference to it on the town website. They may have changed that since I wrote the book. I don't, but no reference to it. You can't find it. And I do think, given the rise of neo Nazism more broadly, that it was a correct decision. But it tells you, like, we can't honor the enemy, even though this was clearly a 18-year-old kid who was swept into Hitler's army. He wasn't a Hitlerite. He wasn't a Nazi. Uh, and he instinctively rescued the two little boys that he'd come to like because he'd been staying with the family for 10 days. And we can't honor him. Yeah, that's the point of your book. We need to start thinking about war differently. And you don't theorize mercy in your book. Why didn't you take theoretical or sociological approach to the issue of killing in war, right? Because as normal people in a normal society, we're taught, I hope anyway, from the moment we're kids, that killing people is wrong. That has to be broken 
in order to get people to join the army and kill people they don't know, sometimes up close and viciously. We're, we're very, very good at breaking social mores and taboos yeah. and getting people to do that, although some people still won't do it. But you, you didn't take a, a sociological, if you will. You were not a sociologist. So no, why did you... I kind of wanted to. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I wrote this book uh, out of exhaustion with war. Uh, from writing about it, teaching about it, talking about it. I'm kind of exhausted. This is the last podcast I'm doing on this book. <laughs> it, it, it gets to me. I, it, this oh, book yeah. gets to me in ways that... Um, I don't uh, mean to uh, laugh. I'm sorry. But, you know, Ian Kershaw doesn't do any more conversations yeah. about Hitler. He's done talking about it. Yeah, I, yeah I just, I, I'm just I'm sick of war. Um, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I let the book stand for it on its own. But I, I wanted to go and find mercy in war. I went looking for it, and I was really hoping to find much more than I did. I was hoping to find things that you could then say to people, whether it's sociologically or historically, you could say to people, look, this seems to work. If we train people this way, if we have these kind of laws and honor codes, we can we can make war less awful. And I just don't think we can. Because in almost every instance, I mean, yes, some armies are more nasty than others. Some armies are more equal than others. But I think in almost every case where I found mercy, the people who exhibited brought it there with them, and it was individual. It wasn't cultural, because you can find vile soldiers in American uniform. You could even find decent soldiers wearing Hitler's Felgo. Um, then there are armies that acted indecently and don't punish and so forth. The Hitler's army was clearly one. The Japanese army in World War II was another and so forth. The Americans and the British and the Canadians were reasonably decent. But you'll still find vile soldiers in all of those armies, war criminals in all of those armies. As the Australians, if you've been following the news, which I'm sure you have, just demonstrated in their courts yesterday. Uh, Their most decorated soldier in their history now convicted basically war criminal. I'll take that back. He wasn't convicted in a war crimes court. He was convicted in a lawsuit that he brought, but the jury held he he had committed murder. Um, All we know from Vietnam, the My Lai massacre was the tip of the proverbial iceberg. I mean, that was one of only a two or three series massacres that were reported. There were over 200 investigated, officially investigated, documented, but not reported, not recorded. I think one of the paradoxes I talk about in this book is that if you have moral heroes that in your army, in your forces, wearing your uniform, that do incredibly morally heroic things, they almost never get reported. In fact, they can be hounded, shut up, persecuted, and so on. Because if your guy stopped somebody from killing civilians, that meant other people in your uniform were about to kill civilians. Like that's the, the my life scenario where the heroes, but it took them 30 years to be recognized as heroes. They had dead animals dropped on their doorsteps. They were hounded by fellow officers. Um, Callie was the hero, the man who did it. Yeah. <laughs> they were Cali rallies, for God's sake. Well, one of the men who did it, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it was a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then, I mean, you know, he never served his full his full sentence, and so on and so forth. This happens again and again and again. It's a basic pattern that I discovered, and I think the reason is because if you say, "Here's a great moral hero. Look what the great things he did on our side," then you have to say you have to break the myth that you have cultivated that everybody in your army is good, that everybody in your army is doing decent things, that your cause is holy, God is on our side which is what every army claims in every war. And you're saying we need more mercy in war. I really took it as an argument that we need less war. But since it seems yes. that wars are not going away, you know, but it's counterintuitive, right? I don't even know if that's the right word to use. War is about killing. And this idea that you can kill your way to victory, well, we take that for granted because that's what we did in World War II. Total victory, a total defeat imposed on the enemy in Germany and Japan, and also in the first Gulf War. We got the idea that we could master war with precision weaponry, suffer very low casualties, and drive Saddam Hussein's army out of Kuwait. And Obama did it with drones in Afghanistan. But this is a mistaken confidence in the application of overwhelming force to win, which means stop starting wars. I mean, we're seeing that now in Ukraine, right? I don't, I don't mean to sound too preachy here. Putin, well, he got seduced by the allure of battle, to borrow the title of your other book. I think that's correct. I also think that we are, and Americans in particular, but not just Americans, the popular culture about war in the West, the sort of popular thinking about war in the West, is trapped in the World War II model. It's trapped. It's called victory uh, disease. Think, oh, yeah, it, it really is. And, and not only that, but that total victory in which you have a complete overturning and transformation of the other society, and he becomes like us. 
the way the Japanese did and the Italians did and the Germans did and so forth. Well, how many wars do we have to wage to try and make other people's cultures Western and have them absolutely catastrophically fail? Can I count them? Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, Libya. I'm leaving about half a dozen out. Um, yeah. and, and the Soviets the, in Afghanistan, uh, etc. We can go yeah. on and on and on. The yeah. point I was making about mercy helping you win wars, I mean, World War II was fought without mercy, without tears, without garlands, and probably had to be fought that way. What I'm talking about is the more recent conflicts, the counterinsurgency conflicts, where the drones that kept Americans safe and alive and didn't have to put boots on the ground, which is why Obama endorsed them along with other people, well, they actually produced far more Taliban than they than they killed. There were acts, and these come from interviews of soldiers who were there and saw them. People confessed war crimes to me or that they had seen war crimes. Some people did. These things clearly, and, and this is the view of these soldiers, it's not my view. I hope in this book try and report rather than editorialize. Their conclusion is that had we been more merciful, had we been more decent, which was the original title of the book, I wanted to call it Decency. Uh, had we been more decent, we wouldn't have created so many enemies, alienated the population, and therefore lost the wars. But the larger point is, of course, we shouldn't have been there in the first place trying to completely convert these societies, which have their own organic culture and long histories, to this notion that we can transplant democracy to Iraq or Afghanistan, which isn't even really a country. Yeah. Because look, it worked in Germany. Well, can you consider the price? <laughs> Every single city in, of any size in Germany leveled uh, occupation of 50 years. How many dead? 65 million dead in that war combined, Germany and Japan. 120 cities in Germany, 64 in Japan leveled. And by the way, we deliberately, not initially, but by the end of the war, we weren't yeah. killing civilians as collateral damage. There was a deliberate targeting of the enemy. And here's a 20th century term for you, enemy civilian. Where did that one come from? Well, that came from the two world wars and our deliberate targeting of civilians. And I say we, I mean the Western Air Forces. Yeah, that's something I wish you had gotten a little into a little bit more in your book. You talk about it a lot, but not the theoretical aspects of it. Julio Duhet, I yeah. suppose, is how yeah. you pronounce his name. He was one of the fathers of modern air power theory, the idea of strategic bombing. You kill a civilian who is sewing a uniform or building an artillery shell, that is just as legit and important as killing a frontline soldier. And it means you don't have to send millions of your 18 and 19 yes. and 20 year olds to go and fight in the trenches, which is what they were trying to avoid. They assumed, of course, we always assume the next war will be like the last one. Most of us do. Well, that's why the uh, U.S. only did 90 divisions in Second World War instead of 215, right? I was going to mention that yes. earlier. That actually, uh, you, you were talking about the competition between Bradley and MacArthur. One of the, the decisions that almost blew up in Americans' faces was the 90 Division Army, the 90 Division decision. It wasn't enough. You have this myth about the Second World War that the United States, everybody went into the Army, and everybody, the whole nation went to war, and united, we can do anything, and look what we did. We brought democracy to the Axis powers, and so on. And elements of truth in that, enough to make it a myth, or at least a legend. 215 but, divisions would have caused some major distortions in the domestic economy with the loss of workers. So we thought and you would have had strikes and riots and man, you can make up for it by just you make up for the difference between 90 divisions and 215 divisions with overwhelming air power, trust in the, the B-17, flying fortress. And, arti and artillery. artillery, and artillery right. yeah. Flying artillery and ground artillery. I mean, basically, tactical bombers are flying artillery. Yeah. And then the strategic bombers, which is a new concept, really developed, in fact, during World War One, and then was developed, as you say, by the theorists. Notable that, you know, an Italian theorist proposes air power that his country is utterly incapable of producing. Um, yeah, as an Italian American, I'm totally okay with jokes about the Italian. <laughs> the only two countries, the only two countries in World War II that took strategic bombing seriously and built the capability to do it were the British and the American. Yeah. And that's because they're both highly casualty averse, the British in particular, after the First World War. Let's fly over the trenches. Let's not have another Somme. Let's have another Verdun. We'll just fly over the trenches and bomb the strategic targets on the other side. They took it seriously. Americans took it seriously. There were arguments on everyone in the U.S. Air Force took it seriously, or U.S. Army Air Force, or in Britain. But it was really the British that implemented it, the Americans who followed it. I will insert one joke before I follow up on that answer. Why did the 5th Italian Navy have glass-bottom boats? 
So we could see its heritage, I've heard. Yes, that. you see the so we could see the first four <laughs> Italian navies. I think that oh, has, okay, okay. I have yeah, a different version. I, I think that joke has been applied to a lot of countries that have been bad at, at fighting. Yeah. I mean and currently the military jokes in this country, which is a farcical attitude to take, are toward the French. My God, oh the my French gosh, dominated yeah. world military history for 300 years. It was the French army that defeated the German army in World War One. They lost a million we, people. Uh, absolutely. And yeah. five million orphans. And, and in World War II, they didn't quit. They were defeated. It was a strange victory, strange defeat. There were ways of explaining it. I do that in a little battle to some degree. Others have done it better than I have. Well, to borrow a title of one of my podcast episodes last year, War doesn't work. I mean, again, it runs counter to what many people might think about our massive, sophisticated, nearly $1 trillion per year military budget, that this weapon, this tool we have, can't possibly lose. And not just the United States, the Soviets in Afghanistan, Russians in Ukraine. It's just not very effective. And, and we're waiting for the Chinese to prove it in, in their theater of that's the right. world as well. But as you say, the victory in the Second World War has established this idea lasting to this day that wars can be won totally. Can I be provocative again? Yeah. What's the last war the Americans actually won? Grenada. Well, I was going to say, since 1945? Yeah. Yeah, I mean. World uh, War II. And if you want to give Grenada, which is, uh, you know, uh, people died, so we'll call it an armed yeah, like conflict. a one-day uh, thing. Yeah, go ahead. But, you know, Korea, a stalemate. Indochina, or we start talking Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, defeat. Uh, I think Iraq, defeat. Afghanistan, humiliation. And you're absolutely right. This is not a uniquely American thing. The Soviets not only lost the war in Afghanistan, they lost their empire. Now, the Americans may be doing it right now, which is fight the Russians or the last Ukrainian. Um, yeah. This may be the way that you should do it. But the notion from World War II is that we take some kid from Iowa, we train him up, we give him the best possible military technology. He's going to overwhelm military force. And he usually does he overwhelm the Afghans with military force, overwhelm the Iraqis with military force, but not tied to any larger strategic purpose or tied to the wrong strategic purpose, which was the idea that we could turn Afghans into us. Cathal Nolan, we thank you once more for helping us think differently about war. And he is the author of Mercy, Humanity in War, as well as The Allure of Battle. On the next episode of History As It Happens, have you heard there's a new series about Watergate? It's on HBO, streaming on HBO Max. It's called The White House Plumbers. We're going to talk about this new comedic experience with an expert on the Watergate tapes. Next, as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 